By 1970, San Francisco head coach Dick Nolan had built a dragon defense, a defense that came out breathing fire and burned anyone who got in its way. John Brody led 1970's Blitzkrieg offense, and on the last day of the season, the 49ers won their first divisional title. In 1971, the offense was better than ever, and again San Francisco became NFC Western Division champions on the last day of the season. Again, the 49er defense was a highly physical dreadnought that led them to a victory over the Washington Redskins for their second playoff win ever. So, with a budding tradition of success, the 49ers faced 1972, hoping to prove for the third straight year that, in the NFC, San Francisco is the best in the West. The San Francisco 49ers opened their season at home against the San Diego Chargers. And the defense flashed off the mark with a great performance that included four interceptions, like this one by number 50, Ed Beard. But the real story was John Brody to Gene Washington, eight times for 140 yards and three touchdowns in an easy 34-3 victory. Those drums at Candlestick Park signaled a war dance, and the San Diego Chargers arrived weaponless. One of John Hadle's few scoring threats was stopped by number 23 Johnny Fuller's interception. And for a minute, the referee forgot who threw the pass. Of course, he could be forgiven because even Hadle forgot that he was supposed to be throwing to the guys in the white shirts. Even with number 13, Wayne Clark, at the controls, the Chargers continued to fall at the drop of an arm. They also fell at the drop of a leg. One thing the Chargers did manage quite well was to snuff out the 49ers' ground game. Although they extinguished the Red Runners, they couldn't put out the fire from above as John Brody and Gene Washington team for three early scores that made the Charger efforts a study in futility. The Brody to Washington combination is only a little better than great, but they're getting better all the time. In the end, the Chargers did manage one startling 62-yard bomb and a field goal to avoid the humiliation of a shutout and to settle for the humiliation of a 34-3 loss. In Buffalo, O.J. Simpson opened up with both barrels and almost single-handedly won the game. John Brody was injured, and number 11, Steve Spurrier, took over and gave a preview of the agony and the glory that lay ahead for the 49ers. 
Despite Spurrier's late score to Ted Qualick, the Bills stunned San Francisco 27-20. And going against the Buffalo Bills, there was no reason the San Francisco 49ers shouldn't have expected a cakewalk. But in the first quarter, John Brody found himself inundated by a wave of blue. Not only was he inundated, but he was also injured, and Brody was forced to leave the contest. Brody's replacement, number 11, Steve Spurrier, threw twice to number 82, Ted Qualick, to give the 49ers a 13-6 lead. But then the Bills' classy runner, number 32, O.J. Simpson, swiveled and snake-kipped his way to 138 yards rushing, which left Buffalo in real good shape. Shaw to number 80, Jan White, tied the game at 13. The 49er defense was definitely not in favor of what Shaw was doing, and they let him know about it. Buffalo's hopes for an upset were dimmed as Larry Schreiber went in from the two to put the 49ers up 20 to 13. But the Bills still had their one big weapon and OJ ran wild. OJ set up the tying score by number 34, Jim Braxton. Time waning, Spurrier's efforts were cut short by number 48, John Pitts, whose interception gave the Bills a chance of pulling off the biggest upset in this young season. Jim Braxton made the chance good, and Lou Saban had his first victory in his return to Buffalo. And from the looks of things, there will be more, and soon. Buffalo 27, San Francisco 20. In week three in New Orleans, San Francisco's total effort defense allowed the Saints only seven yards rushing in the entire game. Tommy Hart slashed in and cut Archie Manning down like ripe wheat. Number 72, Bill Belk, and number 74, Earl Edwards, helped in the sacking of the harvest. Laying in wait up top was all-pro Jimmy Johnson, who had one of four team interceptions. Safety Mike Simpson picked off another one and sauntered in for the score. Number 22, Vic Washington, followed the sweep lead blocking of number 66, Elmer Collette, in a goldward thrust, and then got some on his own.
A block by number 69, Woody Peoples broke Vic loose for a score. And then the offense streaked away unheaded. The 37-2 win set the stage for the first showdown with the arch-rival Los Angeles Rams. In New Orleans, the winless Saints had their work cut out for them as they were going against the healed and healthy 49ers. On the opening kickoff, New Orleans had one of its few successes of the day as Marjeanne Atkins, number 26, raced for 61 yards. But from that point on, it was all San Francisco as they stormed in and sacked Archie Manning five times. In addition to the sackings, the Saints lost the ball four times on interceptions and three times on fumbles. And while the 49er defense looked good, the offense was dynamite with number 22. Now healthy Vic Washington acting as the blasting cap. Vic's score was the first of the game, and the 49ers were off and running. And running is exactly what number 35 Larry Schreiber did so well and with such gusto. Of course, John Brody was feeling well, and of course, that meant Gene Washington was catching touchdowns. It also meant that number 82, Ted Qualick, who's crossing your screen right now, was in line for another Brody scoring shot. The 49er defense in the person of little Mike Simpson, number 38, finished the afternoon scoring with an interception and a 32-yard run, which made the final score San Francisco 37, New Orleans 2. For Archie Manning, it was a tough afternoon, but it may have been even tougher on those who only stand and coach. Playing away from home for the third straight week, the 49ers' puzzling lack of consistency was again evident. Plays dissolved in failure. Concentration slipped away. And although the 31-7 beating by the Rams was bad, the worst was yet to come. On a somber, rainy day, the 49ers came home for the first time in a month. Behind early against the Giants, they had to play catch-up for most of the game. Two scores by Gene Washington kept them in it, but they needed another when in the last minute, John Brody was sacked and suffered an ankle injury. He wouldn't appear again until the last game of the season. With three losses in five games and John Brody gone, the somber California gray closed in and one could almost hear the band playing taps for the 49ers season. But then Johnny Lighting decided to take care of things himself.
Brody's score tied the game at seven. But that the New York football giants were in San Francisco for the first time since 1960, when Alex Webster was a giant running back, and Dick Nolan was a giant defensive back, and Pat Summerall was the giant place kicker. None was as fast as number 22, Rocky Thompson. Oh, it was a little damp in San Francisco, but Thompson's 75-yard return set up a Pete Gogolak field goal. Another kickoff had even stranger results. Vic Washington was hit by, of all people, Pete Gogolak. Willie Williams picked up the loose ball and took it in for an apparent touchdown. But the play had already been blown dead by what was later termed an inadvertent whistle. Sorry about that, Willie. Williams' lost touchdown was equalized somewhat when Ron Johnson was ruled over the goal line before he fumbled to Bruce Taylor. In all, there were eight official fumbles in the game. This one from Charlie Evans to Johnny Fuller set up a 49er field goal. Despite all the fumbles and weird play on Candlestick's soggy carpet, there were flashes of the way the 49ers used to play football. Twice, John Brody hit Gene Washington for touchdowns. Washington now has totaled more than 3,000 yards in receptions in just over three years in the league. The sun came out for Brody's second touchdown pass, and everything looked rosy for the 49ers, who led 17-13, with six and a half minutes left to play. Pete Gogolak's third field goal cut the lead to one point, and then came the biggest play of the game. 49er receiver Preston Riley fell down, and giant cornerback Pete Athos had an easy interception. With only 1.34 to play, Norm Steed handed to Charlie Evans, and suddenly the Giants led 23 to 17. Alex Webster, Dick Nolan, Pat Summerall, and all those guys I used to play against would have known how to celebrate a big win. Charlie Evans and the new Giants might need a little more practice. With only 38 seconds left, Brody dropped back to pass for the last time. An ankle injury forced Brody out, and it was Steve Spurrier who threw the last pass of the game. Pete Athos had his second interception and the only two in the game. More important, the Giants had won their third straight and now are only one game behind in the NFC East. But out of the desolation came Steve Spurrier, John Brody's five-year backup. The big question was, could he turn this team around? The big answer came against the Saints as Spurrier hit Ted Qualick with the second longest pass play in 49er history, 81 yards. He then hit number 17, John Eisenbarger, for another first half score. But in the second half, Steve threw three unfortunate interceptions, which put the Saints on top. Only a Bruce Gossett field goal with three seconds to go allowed the 49ers to escape with a 20-20 tie. In Atlanta, the San Francisco 49ers weren't out to win any friends, and they didn't as Vic Washington took the opening kickoff and zapped 98 yards to Spike City. Now, football by nature is not a friendly pastime, but when these two teams get together, the Hatfields and the McCoys run for cover.
Both teams displayed some moves that made one wonder if perhaps Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali hadn't become assistant coaches. But back to football, where number 64 Dave Wilcox stripped the Falcon blocking and stopped the runner. Number 40, Ken Willard, cut out large chunks of yardage and brought the 49ers in close. Then young Steve Spurrier, playing in place of injured John Brody, hit tight end Ted Qualick in San Francisco, led 21 to seven. Bob Berry brought the Falcons back with a 40 yarder to Jim Mitchell, number 86. But then Steve Spurrier and the 49ers blew the game open. Preston Riley, number 85, juggled one in and proceeded to give Spike City a little refinement. Then came the sports writer's dream, as Ralph McGill, number 49 of the 49ers, who were on their way to scoring 49 points, returned a punt. You guessed it, 83 yards for a touchdown. But the writer's dream was not to be, and copy editors across the country breathed a sigh of relief as the play was nullified by a penalty. However, the 49ers were undaunted as Skip Vanderbunt, number 52, picked off a Pat Sullivan pass and raced it in, all the way now to give San Francisco an amazingly easy 49-14 win over Atlanta. In week seven, the 49ers traveled to Atlanta, where they put together their highest scoring game of the season. Vic Washington stunned the Falcons with a 98-yard kickoff return. This set the tone of a day which belonged to the special teams as much as to anybody. Rookie Ralph McGill, number 49, set an NFL record for most punts returned in a game with nine. Every aspect of the 49ers game was superb. Linebacker Skip Vanderbunt, number 52, intercepted one pass and ran it back for a score. Steve Spurrier hit Ted Qualick and number 85, Preston Riley, for scores which broke the three-game winless streak and gave the 49ers an impressive 49-14 triumph over Atlanta. In Green Bay, as two non-playing quarterbacks got together, Steve Spurrier, with his offensive line adjusting to him better all the time, continued to put the ball in the air, into the hands of his receivers, and into the end zone. He threw for 315 yards, and Gene Washington caught his eighth and ninth touchdowns of the year. But the defense couldn't hold Green Bay's John Brockington, and the Packers ran to a 34-24 victory. With a 3-4-1 record, hopes of a title were fading. San Francisco returned 69 yards in nine plays with Vic Washington sweeping two yards to tide at the end of the first quarter. Forced to do so, the 49ers forgot their plans for sustaining an offense and went for the big play. Gene Washington stepped out for a 62-yard catch and carry, closing the score to 24-17. A repeat of the play shows that Spurrier was well protected while waiting for Washington to beat number 28, rookie cornerback Willie Buchanan. And a perfect go and throw is still the most exciting play in pro football.
But Gene Washington in his fourth year out of Stanford was not finished. After a Packer field goal, Spurrier found number 18 open over the middle. And 17 yards later, the score was Green Bay 27, San Francisco 24. Finally, with only 32 seconds remaining, the Pack iced a game they seemingly had won in the third quarter. Number 48, Ken Ellis picked off a Spurrier sideline pattern, and Green Bay had a much-needed 34-24 victory to stay tied for the lead in the NFC Central with the Detroit Lions. With their team now third in the division, the 49er fans had seen their great expectations turn into a draft from a bittersweet cup. With the Colts in town, number 53, Tommy Hart showed the courage that won him this year's Lynn Ashmont Award as he raced, slashed, crashed, and crawled on his hands and knees to sack the quarterback. While the pass rush was relentless, the deep backs and linebackers were tenacious as they hung all over the Colts. The offensive line, led by Forrest Blue and Lynn Rohde, opened huge holes for number 35, Larry Schreiber, who crashed through for 104 yards. Vic Washington continued to make the big play. Running back Ken Willard, number 40, gathered in one Spurrier pass, and Steve continued to throw for the deep six and Ted Qualley. <laughs> 49ers 24, Colts 21. And whether the fans knew it or not, their big red wave was just beginning to crest. The San Francisco faithful have been somewhat fickle this year, simply because the 49ers have not been the kind of team one could have much faith in. Their season has been a schizophrenic 3-4-1, and one, so no one knew what to expect against the stumbling Baltimore Colts. Steve Spurrier to Ken Willard kept the Colts stumbling as the 49ers heaped more woes on the already dismal year of Baltimore's descent. Number 22, Vic Washington, ran roughshod through the once impregnable Colt defense. Then number 35, Larry Schreiber, rocked in for a score, and suddenly San Francisco's Fairweather faithful had returned. But Baltimore stayed in the game with one bizarre play. Bruce Gossett's kickoff made it only as far as the Colt blocking wedge, where one blocker happened to be running back Norm Bulash, number 36. Bulash was caught from behind, but got off a nifty bounce pass to Nelson Muncy, number 31. The famous Bulash to Muncy combination was not in the cold game plan, but it was much more reliable than the regular cold attack, which continues to grope for identity. Number 14, young Marty Domries, is trying to replace a legend. Place kicker Jim O'Brien, number 80, is trying to be a wide receiver. And ex-assistant John Sandusky is now head man and just trying to bear the grief of it all. What John Sandusky has just seen is a fourth and goal from the San Francisco one. One man feels the pain of the Colts' struggle more acutely than anyone else. That's because Johnny Unitas remembers. He remembers other days when things like this never would have happened.
John Unitas came in for one play, fumbled and did not play again. Number 11, Steve Spurrier, continued to taunt the Colts as he threw into perfect coverage. But these days, perfect is not quite good enough for the Colts as Ted Qualley came up with the ball for a 24-14 49er lead. Finally, Dahmer has found a patch of blue in the gloom as he went on the fly to Sam Haverlack, number 17. The Domery's Haverlack connection put Baltimore back in the game, trailing by only 24-21 with four and a half minutes left. And when Domery's got the ball again, he went right back to the wide open well. This time, however, Haverlack was judged out of bounds and Baltimore had discovered yet another way to lose. Three more passes failed before time ran out and the stunned Colts found themselves one and seven. For nearly two decades, the Baltimore Colts were on or near the top of their profession. Now, painfully, they're learning how the other half lives. Since the days when this number was worn by Gail Sayers, the Bears have become a little less formidable. And last week, they faced the very formidable Steve Spurrier, who opened early with a touchdown to number 82, Ted Qualley. <laughs> Trying to build on his early lead, Spurrier opened a double-barreled attack led by number 22, Vic Washington, on the ground. as the 49er ground game was, the airways were quicker. And Spurrier again went to Qualic and gave San Francisco a 14-0 bow. Then Spurrier went to his other Washington, Gene, for 43 yards and a 21-0 lead. finally decided to make a game of it as Bobby Douglas hit Don Shy number 24. Another Douglas shot to number 43 George Farmer was good for 85 yards and seven points. The 49ers two-man Washington gang, this time it was Vic again, was overpowering and Spurrier had his fourth scoring pass of the day. Bobby Douglas managed to bring the Bears close when he hit number 84 Jim Seymour to make it 27-21. Then the 49ers put it in passing gear. Spurrier to number 35, Larry Schreiber, turned a routine flare pass into a 65-yard game breaker.
On a replay, we can see that although the pass wasn't extraordinary, what Schreiber did after he caught it certainly was. Not only did Schreiber's run cap the 49ers 34 to 21 victory, but it gave Steve Spurrier five scoring passes for the day, which ties the San Francisco record. But more importantly, it proved to the 49ers that they can win and win big with Spurrier instead of Brody starting at quarterback. Gets away a dandy. Oh, that's a beautiful kick. Smith waiting for it, doesn't signal for a fair catch, drops the ball, and it's recovered by the 49ers at the seven-yard line. It was Preston Riley who recovered. Smith did not signal for a fair catch, even though that ball was really hung up there. The 49ers were right there. Smith dropped it. The 49ers have first and goal at the seven. Vic Washington and Ken Willard behind Spurrier on third and goal from the two. Spurrier with the long count again. Steve. Rolling out, looking for someone to throw to. In trouble. Throws for Qualic. He's got it. Touchdown, 49ers. Butka slipped and fell. And Spurrier just threw that ball up in the air for grabs. Rolled to the far side. Turned around. Had big pressure put on him by Charlie Ford coming in from his cornerback position. Butkus fell down. And Qualic made the catch for the touchdown. To the left, Gene Washington to the right. Willard and Vic Washington, the running backs behind Spurrier. The give is to Vic Washington, finds a little opening, goes the 25 to the outside, to the 35, to the 40, to the 45, and out of bounds he goes at the 49-yard line of the 49ers. So a good call by Spurrier that time, just as you hoped he'd do, Gordy. He did not go to the pass. He got Vic Washington to the outside. First and 10. A give on a sweep to Jimmy Thomas, trying to get a block. Doesn't, and a pull down from behind. On a fine play by Brubacher, the corner linebacker reached out, grabbed a hold of Thomas's jersey, and <laughs> yanked him off his feet. A cold rain falling now as the 49ers have the ball at the 16 of the Chicago Bears. Third down and 15. A blitz is on. Spurrier back to pass. Being chased. Looks. Throws for the end zone. Pass hitter. Qualic makes the catch. Goes in for the touchdown. A penalty flag thrown. There will be pass interference. Or it is against the Bears. And Qualic has the touchdown. They put the blitz on. And Spurrier beat that blitz again. And Qualic took the ball away from Ron Smith to go in for the touchdown. Complete for the touchdown. A Great blocking. Uh, and I can see who picked up that block. It, it had to be either Schreiber or Washington who peeled back and picked off the blitzers. Lau Spurrier to throw that strike to Qualic. Gossett will try for the extra point now to the hold of Joe Reed. And Spurrier has, did a good job again, and Qualic just muscled his way into the end zone. There was pass interference called already on the bear. Place down, kick, then it's good. And a look at the scoreboard with 8.59 remaining in the first half. The 49ers 14, the Bears nothing. Harrison, the lone back behind Douglas on this first and 15. Douglas back to pass. He is spinning away, may run, coming to the near side of the 45, to the 40, and is he creamed as he was hit by Wilcox as he got to the 39-yard line. It will be second down, maybe he got back to the 38. Wilcox really low-bridged him. McCann to do the kicking with Ron Smith, the lone man back for the Bears. Good pass from center. And there's McCann's kick. He gets it away. A pretty good one. Smith comes up to make the catch. And oh, was he hit. Oh, was he hit. And it was Johnny Fuller who belted him. And Smith is really stretched out. He'll get up. But reluctantly at the 29-yard line of the 30-yard line. This guy wants to dump him. Well, that's the way it goes. Spurrier back to pass. Looking. Looking. Throwing long. He's got Washington wide open. And it's touchdown 49ers. Gene Washington was all by himself, and Spurrier hit him perfectly for the score. Washington seemed to split the zone as he got down uh, about the 20-yard uh, line, and the Bears waiting for the break, but he outgunned them all. Gossett will try for the extra point now. Now on a 43-yard strike from Spurrier to Gene Washington with a second and goal. 
Spurrier. Back to pass. Has time. He's got him wide open. Vic Watson. Touchdown, 49ers. Washington was turned the wrong way. Then turned around and made the catch as he fell into the end zone. A nine-yard scoring pass from Steve Spurrier. And the 49ers come right back after the Bears touchdown. And Spurrier completes his fourth touchdown pass of the day. They're on second down. Gene Washington to the left. Beasley to the right. Spurrier back to pass. Has time. Lays it off this time to Schreiber. Gets to the 40. 45. The 50. The 45. May go all the way. The 30. The 25. 20. 15. 10. 5. Touchdown 49ers. Schreiber with a super move. They... Chicago Bear defender was setting right at the 45-yard line where it was going to be first down, and Schreiber put his head down as though he was going to run right into it. And then he just stepped to the left. The Bear defender was waiting there, and Schreiber stepped around him, and then it was all the way for the 49ers. So what a game we're seeing here this afternoon. Now Gossett and Reed will try to combine on an extra point here. Waiting for the pass from center. Center to Reed, place down, kick, and it's good. So look at the scoreboard with eight minutes and 30 seconds remaining in the ball game. The 49ers, 34, and Chicago, 21. 49ers unveiled the Steve Spurrier show in the Windy City, and it drew rave notices as Steve became the NFL Offensive Player of the Week by throwing five scoring passes. The 34-21 win put the 49ers back in the title race with one obstacle looming large in their path. For next, they were to meet the Dallas Cowboys in Dallas on Thanksgiving Day. Forty strong, the San Francisco Red Wave rolled into Texas Stadium needing a victory to stay atop the NFC's Western Division. But the Cowboys were ready to feast on this 49er team they had beaten so many times in the past. The challenge for the doomsday defense was Steve Spurrier, and they poured in on the young 49er passer. Spurred by his defense, quarterback Craig Morton fired bullets that creased the seams in the San Francisco secondary. The multi-splendored Dallas attack rolled one way and often caught the 49ers' flow moving in the wrong direction. The yards came tougher on the ground, but Dallas had Walt Garrison, the toughest cowboy of them all. Tucked behind his pulling guard, Blaine Nye, number 61, Garrison battered to a touchdown and a 7-0 cowboy lead. Dick Nolan was properly concerned, but today he would see a defense he had molded in the image of the Cowboys turn defeat into victory. Balancing the experience of 35-year-old tackle Charlie Kruger was the ferocious rush of 23-year-old Cedric Hardman, number 86.
Morton was decked repeatedly. And when number 64, Dave Wilcox, blindsided him, he fumbled on one bounce to number 52, Skip Vanderbunt, who raced to the tying touchdown. After a harrowing first quarter, Steve Spurrier settled down and drifted confidently behind matchless protection until his receivers spun clear of the secondary's web. In the second quarter, Spurrier spotted Gene Washington, number 18, running free to the post. Charlie Waters was called for interference, and one play later, Ken Willard scored, and San Francisco led 14-7. Spurrier received a break when Washington and Ted Qualick, number 82, ended up side by side on a busted pattern. Instead of an interception, Washington turned the play into a spectacular game. When number 22, Vic Washington, picked off Chuck Howley's blitz, Spurrier calmly passed to Qualick for another score. Another look at the play shows that Howley was joined by linebacker Leroy Jordan in a blitz. Jordan, number 55, was bounced by Woody Peoples, and Spurrier's pass was perfect to his tight end. The 31-10 route of Dallas was fittingly climaxed by the defense as Skip Vanderbunt stepped in front of a Morton pass and strolled to his second touchdown. For Vanderbunt, his great day was richened by the knowledge that after 11 weeks, the 49ers had claimed sole possession of first place in the West. With every game a must win, the 49ers found themselves on Doomsday's doorstep. And the 49er defense vowed that they would out-thunder Doomsday. And so they waited, these men of crush and crunch, these hard rock grizzled men of the trenches, these men of the big red wave. They waited knowing that when the wild rumpus began, it was up to them to muffle Doomsday's drum. Cedric Hardman made good the vow, and so did Tommy Hart. Ed Beard and Dave Wilcox made good the vow. With Dallas reeling, number 64, Dave Wilcox unleashed the 49er lightning and came crashing down on Craig Morton, who went one way while Skip Vanderbunt and the ball went all the way. While Charlie Kruger and the defense rested, Steve Spurrier was walled in behind Cass Vanizak and Randy Beisler, throwing the bullet, threading the needle unhindered. He hit on his 16th scoring pass of the season, and then fittingly the defense and Skip Vanderbunt capped the magnificent victory and finished off the Cowboys 31-10. As sweet as victory was, it could not be savored for long, because coming up was a showdown with the Rams before a Monday night TV audience. Although they were playing at home before a sellout crowd, the 49ers, the leading sacking defense in the NFL, couldn't get to Roman Gabriel, and the Rams won 26-16. With two games to go, the situation was critical. The 49ers had to beat Norm Van Brocklin's division-leading Falcons, 
So the 49ers, the NFC's leading passing team, reversed the procedure and turned to the ground game. Number 24, Jimmy Thomas, averaged nine yards a carry as he drove San Francisco goalward. Vic Washington barged to within easy scoring range. And twice, Ken Willard took it in. With Ed Beard and number 56, Bob Hoskins leading the way, the defense kept Atlanta off the scoreboard. In the 20 to nothing shutout, victory had been paid for by the hard rock men of the Big Red Wave. And now with the Vikings in town, it all came down to one game. For Coach Dick Nolan, a loss to the Falcons meant goodbye playoffs. His greatest asset was Steve Spurrier, who had led the 49ers through some tough times following John Brody's injury. For Coach Norm Van Brocklin and his Falcons, it was the most important game in their history. The first they'd ever played with a division title at stake. Right from the outset, the Falcons made it obvious that on this day, they were playing for keeps. But despite their Rockham defense, they were forced to watch nervously as the 49ers on two Bruce Gossett field goals opened a 6-0 halftime lead. In the second half, the Vic Washington Express bucked and bruised the 49ers to within easy scoring range. And twice, Ken Willard, number 40, plowed in for one-yard touchdowns to give San Francisco a 20-0 lead. The Falcons tried valiantly to come back, but big gainers such as this one were nullified by miscues. Although Atlanta recovered this one, there were three other drive killers that they lost. And in the end, the deciding factor was the 49ers' stormy defense that charged and sacked and recovered and inspired their way to victory. When it was a matter of inches, the 49er defense got those inches and the Falcons came up empty. The final score was San Francisco 20, Atlanta nothing. The 49er defense had paid the price and for men like 14-year veteran Charlie Kruger, who is nearing the end of his road in the NFL, the price was a bargain even if it meant a temporarily swollen eye. Win or lose. It was the 49ers' third game in 12 days. And once again, it was the defense that held the opponent at bay. For Steve Spurrier, bad breaks led to three costly interceptions. And the Vikings capitalized to lead 17-6. Then it all came down to the last quarter of the last game of the season. And there was only one man the 49ers could go to. Vikings 17, 49ers 13, six minutes remaining. 
Time for the defense to make one supreme effort to stop the Vikings to get the ball back. Now the offense was rolling again. And it all came down to a third down with 35 seconds left. One play, one down that could make or break a season. And John Brody to Dick Witcher made it. 49ers 20, Vikings 17. For the third year in a row, the San Francisco 49ers were the NFC Western Division champions. The only team in the NFL to win its division each year since the inception of the playoff system. They would now meet the Dallas Cowboys in the playoffs. On the following kickoff, Vic Washington atoned for his earlier fumble with a return of 56 yards to the Viking 41. But the aging Purple Gang rose up to stop any further advance by San Francisco. San Francisco settled for a Bruce Gossett field goal and a 7-3 score at the end of the first quarter. Offensive play by number 38, Mike Simpson, saved a touchdown for San Francisco. But as we said, this was to be a day of turnovers for the 49ers, and on the very next play, Spurrier's pass was deflected by Carl Gersbach and intercepted by Charlie West. No score resulted from that turnover, but late in the quarter, still another turnover squelched the boys from the bay again. A pass to Gene Washington picked up 35 yards, by far the biggest gain of this mistake-ridden first half, discounting kickoff returns. Then with excellent field position for the first time today, Spurrier passed right into the hands of Paul Kraus on the 17-yard line. Minnesota soon gave the ball back with a disastrous error of their own when Mike Eyscheid went back to punt. This Minnesota mistake on the 25 led to Bruce Gossett's second field goal of the first half and San Francisco's sixth point. The 49ers only trailed by one at the half, but had turned the ball over four times, and at this point, the division title seemed as misty as Northern California's weather. Trailing now 17 to six, it was time to bring back Brody. Brody had been injured earlier in the year, but for the past three weeks, he has been ready to go. However, Spurrier's strong performance until today had kept Brody benchbound. Now, in this do-or-die situation for San Francisco, head coach Dick Nolan decided it was time for Brody to reappear. On the last play of the third quarter, Brody began to move the 49ers. In the first of the fourth quarter, Ted Qualick made his first reception of the game and carried to Minnesota's 11-yard line.
On first down, Brody hit John Eisenbarger on a play designed for Eisenbarger to then pass downfield, but forced to make a leaping catch, he had to run. On second down, Jim Marshall's great play on Vic Washington cost the 49ers five yards. Forced to throw on third and 11, Brody forced his pass to Qualic, and Paul Kraus intercepted his second theft and San Francisco's sixth turnover. Brody's bold thrust perhaps breathed life back into the 49ers and they stopped the Vikings to give Brody another shot. But again Brody misfired and Seaman intercepted his second interception and San Francisco's seventh turnover. Francisco's failing playoff hopes when Mike Eyscheid's punt was down by Terry Brown on the one foot line. With nine minutes left, the 49ers were 99 and two third yards away and still trailing by 11. Brody's only choice was to throw and a pressure pass to Eisenbarger got some operating room. Then from the 15, Brody stepped up into the pocket and hit Gene Washington who had a step on Charlie West. play gained 53 yards and three plays later Washington outfought Bob Bryant for the touchdown. Brody had moved the 49ers over 99 yards in two and a half minutes but the celebration was kept to a minimum for San Francisco still trailed by four with just over six minutes to play. Offensive adrenaline splashed onto the 49er defense and they sacked Tarkenton for the fourth time in the game. San Francisco's defense leads the NFL in sacks and they had gotten one when they needed it most. But on fourth down and 12, the 49ers saw an incredible break go against them. On the punt play, San Francisco was called for holding, bringing an automatic first down for Minnesota. The Vikings used this break well, grinding almost five minutes off the clock. When the 49ers offense finally got the ball, only 90 seconds remained and they were 66 yards away needing a touchdown as a field goal would leave them one point shy of the playoffs. The 49ers got a break when Seaman interfered with Ted Qualick to move the ball to the Viking 26. Again, San Francisco tried the Eisenbarger option play and though it got Larry Schreiber momentarily open, Paul Krause's great play saved the touchdown. On third down, Brody hit Vic Washington, who carried to the three, but the 49ers had no timeouts left, so with 40 seconds left, Brody would have to pass San Francisco into the playoffs. First down, Jim Marshall swatted away a Brody pass. Second down, Marshall deflected away a Brody pass.
third down and 30 seconds away from elimination, Brody rolled out and directed traffic. Just 25 seconds remained when Brody hit Dick Witcher and sent San Francisco into the playoffs. Minnesota would get the ball once more, but they could not score. John Brody had risen from the depths of the bench to lead San Francisco into the playoffs for the third straight season. It was a remarkable turnaround for Brody. At 37, he does not have many seasons left. And with 27-year-old Steve Spurrier playing so well, this indeed could have been Brody's last year. But with an entire season riding on the 49ers' last possession of the year, John Brody had saved it. The 20 to 17 victory over Minnesota marked the third straight season that San Francisco won their division title in the last regular season game. They have yet to advance to the Super Bowl, but riding a reborn John Brody, they may make it yet. In the NFC playoff game against Dallas, the 49ers started with the best of all possible plays as Vic Washington blazed all the way with the opening kickoff. Vanderbunt continued his one-man vendetta with Craig Morton as he intercepted two passes. The rest of the defense hit and hit and forced five errors. John Brody turned the errors into points. Three times Larry Schreiber plunged in to give San Francisco fans a 28-13 fourth quarter lead and dreams of an NFC championship. The dream became a nightmare when Roger Staubach entered the game and miraculously led his team to 17 points. The clincher came with 52 seconds left to play. Defeat is the bitterest way to end any season. Candlestick Park in San Francisco was the site of a rematch between the 49ers and the Cowboys. On Thanksgiving Day, San Francisco had beaten Dallas 31 to 10, but there was much more at stake in this game, as both teams hoped to grab the first nugget on the way to the Super Bowl goal. The 49ers qualified for the playoffs on John Brody's two last period touchdown passes on the regular season's last date. This is typical of their air-oriented attack. As combined, he and backup Steve Spurrier threw the most touchdown passes in the NFL. Although Dallas's Craig Morton set a team record for completions in a season, and he has super snatchers in Ron Sellers, Billy Parks, Lance Allworth, and Bob Hayes, the Cowboys move best on the ground with Rayfield Wright number 70 and his line mates making room for 1,000 yarder Calvin Hill and all-purpose Walt Garrison. So it was the air-conscious San Francisco 49ers against the ground-grabbing Dallas Cowboys as both hoped for an early Christmas gift from Cycling Santa, advancement to the conference championship game. This game was to be the highest scoring of the four divisional playoffs and seven points went up when Vic Washington fumbled, then rumbled, 97 yards with the opening kickoff. <laughs> 
Washington crossed the Dallas goal line just 17 seconds into the game. The first kickoff return for a touchdown against Dallas since 1966. For contrast, consider Cliff Harris's return of the following kickoff. He went only one-fourth as far and went down twice as hard. Yep. Tried to run and fumbled. When hit by number 43, Wendlin Hall. Hall, a rookie, was starting for the injured Mel Phillips. And he was to be a critical character in the outcome of the game. Early in the second quarter, San Francisco cashed the break when Larry Schreiber busted in from the one. Ted Gwalek signaled touchdown, and the 49ers led 14 to 3. On Dallas's next possession, they again turned it over. Rushed hard by the league's best sacking line, Morton underthrew, and Skip Vanderbunt, number 52, intercepted. In their earlier meeting, Vanderbunt had scored two touchdowns. And he was to be a burr under the cowboy saddle again in this game. Then with a view from our opposite side camera, Brody hit Washington with a perfect pass. The only way to beat Mel Renfro's close coverage. From the one, Shriver scored his second touchdown and San Francisco led 21 to three. Despite the big deficit, Dallas refused to be blown. But things weren't any better in this game as Morton's pass went through Billy Parks' hands right to Mr. Vanderbunt again. This turnover would again help set up a score. Though stopped on fourth down, from good field position, Jim McCann coffin cornered a punt at the five. On the next play, Hill was racked by Charlie Kruger and fumbled. After a struggle, Winland Hall again made his presence known. To this point, the rookie had set up one score by forcing a fumble, and now with this recovery, he set up Schreiber's third short plunge. With 20 minutes left, Dallas trailed by 15. Landry decided it was time to bring on Staubach. Injured early in the season, he had thrown just 20 passes for the year. He has been ready for quite a while now, but Landry had stuck with Morton. However, Staubach was not to be the Messiah just yet, as he showed he could still scramble, but fumbled on his first series. The lost ball gave San Francisco another scoring chance off the turnover. But this time, Bruce Gossett missed a field goal from the 32. Big pass to Parks, and Dallas was down by five. Now only 90 seconds remain, and an onside kick was Dallas's only chance. San Francisco knew it, but it worked. The ball bounced off Preston Riley and Renfro recovered. Less than a minute and a half remained for Dallas's last run at a berth in the conference championship game. As both teams watched, Staubach moved Dallas 50 yards with three bold strokes. First down from the 50. Staubach found no one open and scrambled for 21. First down from the 29. Staubach hit Parks with a perfect sideline pass.
first down from the 10. 56 seconds left. Staubach's bullet pass past Winland Hall, found Sellers, and climaxed an incredible comeback. San Francisco would get the ball again, but could not score. Dallas had taken the first step on a return to the Super Bowl. History had been repeated. One game before, John Brody had come in in relief and pegged two fourth-quarter touchdown passes to put San Francisco into the playoffs. This time they were put out of it when Roger Staubach came in with all the chips on the table and threw two touchdown passes in the last 90 seconds. It was an unbelievable reversal of 49er fortune. But the 49ers 8-5 and 1 record was a good one and they could look back at their accomplishments with pride. They could be proud of a defense that cast a baleful eye at their opponents and then came down hard on them with the likes of 14-year vet Charlie Kruger, number 70. Tommy Hart, the Lynn Ashmont Award winner, had 86 unassisted tackles for the year. Number 74, six foot seven inch Earl Edwards also bagged his share of ball carrying. And the meanest man, number 86, Cedric Hardman, was a key to the front four that led the NFL in sacks with 46. Number 32, Mel Phillips, and number 23, Johnny Fuller, gave the 49ers crafty experience in the secondary. Number 44, Bruce Taylor, had another good season protecting his area from the deep six. But when it came down to sock and tear and stick, no one, but no one, was tougher than the San Francisco Big Red Wave. With Jimmy Johnson, Mike Simpson, Wendland Hall, and the linebackers leading the way, the 49ers' approach to ball carriers was less than subtle. Special team stood out as punter Jim McCann allowed only three and a half yards per return when his boomers allowed anything at all. Steve Spurrier came up with a super year as the cool young signal caller threw for 18 touchdowns and contributed much toward the 49ers conference leading passing total. Of course, when you've got number 82 to throw to, passing becomes a little easier. In 1972, Ted Qualick, who many consider the best tight end around, caught nine touchdown passes. Wide receiver Gene Washington has also become one of the best around. His 12 scoring catches led the NFL. Second-year running back Larry Schreiber developed into one of those runners who won't go down the first time he's hit. it was that the 49ers finished 1972 in the NFC as the best in the West for the third straight year. In 1973, they'll be going for four in a row. But there's more to shoot for than best in the West. 
And there's no reason why 1973 San Francisco 49er team can't be the best of the rest.